But then I'll kind of use creative, I'll take some creative license and really start to dial in just by, literally by feel. And I'll probably rotate this just a little bit. I tend to not hit things directly with light, but kind of angle them in a little bit. And this, this Fresnel is basically as zoomed in as it can possibly be. So let's take a quick shot and then we'll, we'll zoom out and see what the difference is. So that's a little better. You're getting, so this is the original and it looks a little dead, but I've seen, I enjoy this shot and it's nice, but it is a little, from my taste, it's a little flat and that's all it's really about is getting to understand what you like and that's how your style develops. So I, I'm getting enough highlights on those berries to where my eye's not going directly there, but the, uh, um, I think that's, that's definitely enough. And another, another thing about post-production to remember is, you know, with medium format, one of the reasons I love medium format so much is that when I took my images from a DSLR, I had a really nice, I mean, a gorgeous lens on it. And they turned out great, but they felt brittle in Photoshop. They felt a little, like if I really needed to work on them or move them in one direction or the other, they really, you started to see some artifacts in Photoshop. And when, I, when you take an image, you know, with the, the size of files these are, with the bit depth, when you take them into Photoshop, and you, I, I took an image that was way underexposed when I got the camera, just to test it out. And then I brought, you know, the, the shadow recovery all the way up. And it kind of got me to where I wanted to be with almost no noise, which I could never do, you know, with, with, my, other, with my other camera. That was one of the reasons. It's just malleability in, in post. I do a lot of, you know, CGI work and 3D work. And the images you get from there that you render out are oftentimes 32-bit. I mean, the files you can just do anything with, and they never gain noise. They're extremely large files. But I, I kind of wanted more of that with the files I was getting photographically. So that's one of the reasons I stepped up to that. Um, so now, I think we're, we're, we have our lighting dialed in. What I'm really liking are the, the way, the reason I use this lighting setup with pasta dishes and you know, just general still lifes like this is that you're going, if you're gonna have steam, or if you're gonna have any sort of translucent material like leaves or basil or anything like that, berries, you're going to get some really nice um, highlights and translucency coming through there, as long as this front light edging out the front. So you're, you're not only getting the detail of the light raking across the front of the, these are bay leaves, so the front of the bay leaf, you're also getting that secondary light coming through the back to give you that highlight if that's what you're looking for. So this is a great starting point, and then from there, you know, I, I might turn the handle. This, this, it's hard to tell what this is. I like, you know, anything in frame, I don't, I like the viewer to at least be able to have a guess at what they're looking at. And so when you put the handle there, it's a little bit more, it creates a little bit more of a circular motion in the shot. Just kind of lets your eye go around and around. And one of the reasons I just brought up bit depth and shadow recovery is that when I shoot um, a lot of professional retouchers will really, they, they won't get your file, when they're doing a multi-layered composite, they won't get your file looking perfect or beautiful. What they're doing is trying to make sure they have the most information to work with later. So they'll bring up shadow depth, they will reduce highlights almost more than you would normally think to do so. That way when they go into Photoshop, they have room to bend and manipulate the image. And that's really important. So it's really important to kind of get your highlights, if that's your approach, is to get your shadows really under control and brought up. So I will bring in a fill card, even if my goal is to bring it down and make it, you know, the, and to re-deepen those shadows. It's not, it's not what I want to start out with. And if you can get it in camera without having to increase the shadow fill, but I'll show you what I mean by the shadow fill. Like you can get, you can crank it, and it just, there, there's no banding, and there's no bizarre visual artifacts. And we're talking about reds here, like deep reds, which are often troublesome. So, you know, I would probably bring it, shadow fill a little bit up to here before I export it for Photoshop. Um, there's a lot you can do with Focus. This is the capture software for Hasselblad, which I love because it's, it's really all about the way the software is designed. It's so focused on, on the capture. Um, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be a capturing software. It, it, it does a lot of other things, but when I'm using a capture software, I want it to be really good at capturing images and exporting. That's really all and doing some shadow fill and shadow recovery. 
a lot of the stuff, if it becomes too heavy or too complex as a software, it can really start to bog down your workflow. Um, so it, it really has everything you need and not much that you don't, and it's just really nice to work with. And it's tied so closely to the camera. And they, do, they also have an app on the iPad, which I occasionally use for client review, which is really nice. And that ties together really well with the camera. So I'm liking where we're at. I think we should, you know, the front of the bowl looks nice and bright, and I think we're there. Another thing I'm, is right before I take the final shot, I'm always checking focus. Is the focus spot on? With this big viewfinder, it's so nice and easy to check, too. So I'm going to focus. My, my creative decision is going to be a focus on the top of that fig on the top of the bowl and kind of let everything before and after kind of fall to the wayside. You know, 6.8 in medium format is, is pretty shallow still. I, I'm not sure what the exact equivalent with DSLRs would be. It's not too far off. I don't get, t you know, too bogged down with technical details. I'll make sure that my ISO is low. But I'm, I, when I'm, I'm not thinking in terms of 6.8. I mean, I've learned all that. But when I'm, when I'm working in the moment, I'm just thinking too shallow to this. And I, I almost just dial in. I, I don't even know what number it is at the end of it, what the f-stop is or what the shutter speed was. is because my shutter speed in a studio environment is essentially always around 500 or something like that. Um, but with, with the depth of field, honestly, for most projects, especially commercial projects, when I'm not shooting for myself, I, I try and get the most depth of field that I can. And then they will often in post-production, if I'm not handling it, reintroduce some depth field, which sometimes looks real, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's just a different way of working. But the nice thing about this camera, and I don't know if we switch to the overhead view to see. Now it's, let me see, I can actually just take the lens off. Let me turn off the camera real quick. Hopefully we won't have to do a massive reboot, but it's definitely worth showing. This is one of the primary reasons I love this system so much. It's just the, the tilt shift adapter for, for Hasselblad's is ridiculous. It is built like a tank. And it, this is attached to an 80 millimeter lens. This is their, I think, I don't know if it comes with the camera, but it's like the, the lens, it's, it's almost like a 55, something like that on a DSLR. It's like the, the main lens you would go to uh, before you choose other, go other op with other options. But this is connected to, I don't know how much this adds to the focal length. It's some, maybe this is like a 110, somewhere in there, once you put this on. So it will add some focal length to any lens that you use. But just the way you can dial it in. I've had tilt shifts with my DSLR, which were great. Um, but they, they've all since, like the gears will wear out and they'll start to kind of shift on their own a little bit if you use them heavily. And I mean, this one, it's just, like you, you'd have to hold it to really understand. So I, I urge you to at least rent one or check it out. And that's the thing with all this gear too. A lot of the gear I used when I first started out was all 100% was rentals. I just got it over the weekend to try it out. And once you get used to it, then you start to know what it brings to the table. And once you understand that, you'll know when you're ready to upgrade your gear. You should only upgrade your gear if it's going to make you money, if it's going to make life easier, if it's going to make you faster. So that's really, and, and this gives you, you know, between the brown color packs and, and um, the medium format, this is all stuff I had worked with off and on over the years and really got an understanding of what it could bring to the table so that when, you know, as clients grew and, and, and money came in, I was able to, you know, invest in what I needed to invest in to make images in a, you know, in a, in a reasonable time frame and, and a reasonable enough quality. And, you know, I'll rent, I'll, I love the 50 megapixel too. I think that's a sweet spot for cameras. It's, it's really good for packaging. 90% of what I do can be done and will almost probably forever be able to be done in 50 megapixels. If I need, if there's a usage at the end that is really going to need high resolution, you can rent uh, 100, you know, I've got some friends who have 100 megapixel cameras. Uh, if you shoot fashion, it just depends what industry you're shooting for. I know fashion, you, you can't have enough megapixels and for some things, but for food and especially packaging, anything that needs to go to print on a small format can easily be done in 50. So, and you get really nice, beautiful, clean pixels on this. But this tilt shift's amazing. So I'll, I'll, let me reattach it to the camera. I guess long story short. Uh, and when you, have, when you have the tilt shift, there's an adapter that gets the camera higher off of the tripod. That was another thing is there's, there's some, a lot of my uh, DSLR tilt shifts, some will work 
and, and you have to have a separate um, you have to have a separate tilt shift for every focal point you know focal length that you want to have a tilt shift for so there's like I think 19s and 28s and 45s and 85s something like that but this it's a single attachment that you can put four or five different lenses on that they make so you're getting that the, the adapter which is never going to fail you and then you can just attach I think there's there's a multitude of lenses that are completely compatible with it so you're, you're basically adding uh, you know, a longer focal length to a bunch of your lenses and the ability to t tilt shift with a single unit without having to, to repurchase all these different tilt shifts. So this, this system is just fantastic. You'll see this on a lot of, if food photog there's a food photographer that uses Hasselblad, this will often be a part of their camera rig. I use this actually more to get, to get more in focus rather than less. But so the, the camera will, it, when you rotate the, um, this will probably be hard to see, but when you rotate, you can see the lens kind of tilting up and down. This is the tilt movement, and this is what I use. I rarely shift. Shifting is kind of when you want to see stuff at, from a higher angle, but still be down low. So if, if you know, if I'm doing a cocktail shot and there's a there's a there's a big beam maybe with a cocktail on it, you'll see some really dramatic angles where you're kind of, it kind of looks like you're looking up at it, but there's no distortion from the angle, and that oftentimes that'll be from the photographer shifting the the lens upward to kind of get a more natural look while still having that nice. Uh, from below kind of look and I love that angle a lot. That's the only time I tend to use shift though Another great thing about this attachment is it has really nice indicators of where you're at oftentimes with uh, Tilt shift lenses you will not know that you're tilted and then you'll shoot a bunch of frames and you're like, oh good All right, so but this one is it's it's pretty obvious if you're if you're uh, tilted or not so I'm actually going to tilt downwards. When I'm shooting packaging, I'll, I'll tilt down to actually get a lot more in focus without having to focus stack. Focus stack can introduce some problems that's gotten so much better that it's really not an issue if things aren't moving. But I will, um, I will use this. So let me tilt, I'm going to tilt down, which will bring the focal plane not like this, you know, perpendicular to the lens, but it'll actually kind of rake across the top of the bowl just to get a little bit more, and then we'll see if we like it. If we don't, then that's fine too. Um, all right, let's take a shot. This is tilted, how many degrees here? We're at a full 10 degrees. So let's turn camera back on. Boot time's not too bad on this. It's pretty quick. And you'll get an indicator both on the camera and on the focus software. When, the, when, this, um, when this yellow dot lights up, that means the uh, camera's fully connected. And then you're ready to go. Now it's important if you're gonna be shooting, like when I do splashes, if you're shooting a lot of different shots in a row, it's important to have the mirror up on this, whereas a DSLR can be kind of quick on its feet with that. Um, that, that noise you just heard, I don't know if you heard it, but I, this, this button right here will raise or lower um, the uh, the camera, so then then you can shoot at a really high pace and not and not have uh, the actual shutter in the way of the speed, so it goes quite a bit quicker. But I mean, that's not a concern here. So let's take a quick take a quick shot. I knew if I disconnected it, it would. Uh, let me do a quick reconnection here. But this will this will give us probably front to back sharpness even at six I think I was at six eight all right let's see if we can get it here normally I a lot of photographers I don't know if most photographers have this issue but it'll tend to be that if you have any connection problems it'll happen at like at 2 30 in the afternoon during a shoot I don't know why that's the magic number but my camera no matter what I'm using regardless of brand will just like in this instance it's 12 30. <laughs> sure why not yeah. early's fine um so Another nice thing, I mean, anytime you have uh, Hasselblad and Broncolor are tight at the hip, so it's nice, really nice to have, um, this is my favorite um, transceiver. It's, it's so low profile. Like, I love the durability of Pocket Wizards. This, like, when you have the, the camera rotated at a 90 degree, degree angle, it's still super low profile. And this is a random tangent, but I love this thing. It's so tiny, and it works beautifully. Um, it's a Broncolor RFS 2.1 transceiver, and it's just tied up. You don't even need to have a, it, it just auto connects to the, um, to the flash unit. So it's nice, because I would constantly bump into, on a busy set, 
that transceiver I would constantly be bumping into. All right, so we've got, um, I think we've got sharpness from the currents all the way back to the back of the bay leaf back here. So that's, if you see, there's a dramatic difference between the two. And you gotta re, you, you know, if you tilt, you gotta readjust your frame. So let me bring this down just a touch. Take another shot here. And you'll see the, um, it's quite a bit sharper. And it, it depends. So it, now, it, if you do not want the jar of cream, so I've got some cream off to the left. And basically what the scene is, it's just making, you know, like jam or ice cream or something. So we've got some dairy products in a container for it to go into. So that's kind of the story it's telling. But you'll notice that you can see the rim of the cream jar in focus. And if that's not necessarily what you want, there's always the option, not only can you tilt, but you can, you can twist your tilt. So you can twist in, you know, various degree increments. And this might get us where we want to go. Let's, let's just tee. It's not often I'll actually make this rotation. And again, you've got to, you've got to adjust your frame, but you'll notice now that the, um, that's no, you're getting the front berries in focus and you're getting the back of the bay leaf in focus, but now this is blurry again. So you're actually, the amount of control you have over where the focus falls is pretty dramatic. So that's, that's really one of the reasons I love this um, unit so much is for that, the tilt shift unit alone is just worth it. So let's get back to square one here and I will, how are we doing on time, 33? Let's switch over to the second lighting setup I'm really, let me do a fill and get a final shot here. And so the angle, I'm, I, I want this Pico box to hit the light and then the uh, angle reflection to be equal that will, and I usually, I tilt it up a little bit so that the bottom of the bowl gets some light. You can see it kind of working as you hold it and, and move it around. So that kind of gets us, let's take another shot here. Yeah, it seems to be updating here. I think that, I like that, um, I like that shot. I think everything there is falling into place. So let's get, let's get a second lighting set up here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, this is the first one. So from here you can, you know, if you want to have, you know, a mirror hitting the fig or, you know, a, a scrim kind of diffusing some of the light off the top, those are the decisions you can make as you shoot beyond this lighting setup. So this is a great start to reveal as much texture as possible. But then from there, I'll start to reduce using flags and gobos and all this stuff. Even just, I mean, anything will work. You can even just, I mean, just with the modeling light going, you can see sometimes I'll come down and actually make it more directional and, and especially if it's a moody scene. But this is a really good starting point and then you, you can take it from there and at least you, have, you know where to begin. So you're not just completely like, what do I do? You, you know where to go with it. So let's take this shot. Actually, I got that one already. Let's, let's move some of the lights. I'll turn the modeling lights off. We do have one person asking if we could show the effect of tilting the lens through live view on the computer, if that's possible. Um, yeah, let's see what we can do. I, I think the modeling lights should be more than enough. Let's, um, yeah, let's bring the eyes. See if I can get the ISO cranked. Did it go back to uh, yeah? I think I it freaked out on me. It looks like it's going through like a reset phase here. Uh -oh. It's rare that I use live view. I will. The only time I'll use it really is if. Um, this is actually a really good use for it to showcase the uh, tilt shift. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're back. Yeah, we're back. I also don't typically shoot on a laptop. The connections I find are just, uh, we've got an, uh, one of those like, we're in all um, Windows Studio just because we do a lot of motion in 3D, but um, 
the laptops can be a little thinner here, it seems sometimes. I'm, I rarely work on location, too. Um, let's check this out again and see if we can get there. So it's it's subtle. I don't know if you're if that's coming through. Let me get the ISO a little, little bit higher. Just so we're not totally in the dark. This should work. So let's do okay, so let's do a shift. Let's get the tilt back to zero. So the tilt indicators are on the right, and we're back at zero on tilt. And then they have these locking mechanisms, which are fantastic. To, oh no. Oh, and our overhead too. <laughs> Oh, did you lose overhead? That's okay, I got it. Oh, okay. All right, let's go back to, we still have, yeah, we have this. So let's mess, mess around with this. So the, um, before it fails on me again, I think a lot of it just has to do with the USB power maybe or something. So this is, this is, this is shifting up and down. So this gives you, this gives you the ability to kind of move camera up and down, not tilt, but just vertically up and down but the par there's, there's no parallax going on. There's no, the relationship between the pot and the background and the front components are identical. So, you, so it's not it, the same as tilting. It just gives you that nice little, if you need to make, especially if you don't, if you have a tripod and you don't have a camera stand like I have in the studio, I have the ability to make these nice vertical adjustments really quick. But on a tripod, you gotta redo every single leg and it becomes kind of a hassle. So this is actually kind of a good way just to kind of get some elevation on your tripod without actually having to redo the legs. So we can go back, let's go back to live view one more time and I'll show you the tilt. So the tilt will actually require me to kind of like mess with the, uh, the actual tripod head here real quick. So this is, let's go back. It doesn't seem to want to, I wonder if this has to do with an HDMI connection or not. It's always really, uh, really dependable on my when I need it. A lot of the times for live view, I'll use it for um, if I have the camera way up high on a massive overhead shot and I need remote, you know, remote focus. It's, it's really helpful in that regard. So this is the tilt. Oh no, we lost it again. All right, let's try it one more time. I have so many things plugged into this laptop. It's so mad at me right now. All right, I'll show you real quick. Let's get live view active, and here we go. Nope, it just doesn't want to cooperate, I'm afraid. But yeah, the, the, what you're getting in the tilt shift is just, it, it, it messes with the focal plane so that it's not completely perpendicular to your camera. So if, you, if, I, were to tilt the shi if I were to tilt the lens upward, it would actually be more, the, shallow, the depth of field would be way shallow because it's no longer going across the surface of what I'm shooting, it's actually just the opposite. So let's tilt it all the way up and tilt down, see if you can see it here. Um, everything really, the, the depth of field is almost non-existent. In fact, I have, to, I have to shift my focal point backwards here just to get it, so you'll see the, the fig is in focus, but everything else is like really not in focus. And that's what happens when you tilt it up, is you're actually, you're, you're making the um, depth of field invert so that you're, you're getting this really nice, so what, what that's really good for is, in a practical sense, not just getting everything in focus, but from an artistic sense, is if you have a cocktail, and you want to get the surface of the cocktail fully in focus, or a wedding cake, you know, or, or a portion of a wedding cake fully in focus, and then nothing else in focus, then you have the ability to do that in camera. Now, you don't always want to do that. There's the, the focal filters in Photoshop have gotten so good that if you, if you just want something, you know, a slice of something to focus, sometimes it can be done in post. So a lot of this, for me at least, the, t the advantage of the tilt shift is the fact that you can, you can get more in focus and avoid having to focus stack, which is what I try and do as much as I can. And focus stacking being just, if you don't know, taking shots at various focal, you know, lengths, maybe going to F8 and then taking a shot in focus here, focusing forward, taking a shot here and here and here until you have the whole scene completely in focus. And then you'll go into a piece of software and combine them all together so that the sharpest parts of each shot are all combined. Uh, there's cameras that will do it automatically. I just like the manual control of just knowing the different, because sometimes you don't need, you know, when you're doing a focus stack, you don't need to, there's certain degrees, which you, it doesn't need to be this perfectly equal spacing of the focal points. As you go, for, you know, get further into the frame, you can 
kind of cheat it a little bit and maybe use less photos. So I, I just like the manual control of it, and I just do it in, um, in a piece of software after the fact. So that's the tilt shift. Um, and you know when you rotate, when I did that really shallow depth of field rotation, where it was just getting the fig and nothing else, hmm. when you tilt it, you're maybe getting this band in focus, and when you tilt it, you're getting maybe this band. So that's why it left the ridge of that container alone, because the, the actual plane of focus was rotating. You can actually go all the way vertical. So if I took a shot where you just wanted this line of figs and bay leaves to be in focus and absolutely nothing else, then you just go, let's see if we can try it. Just mess around here. Nice thing about this is you don't have to worry about you know anything bumping into anything, because it was made to work together. And then you always have to double check that you're still that you're still shifted. You don't want any kind of weird shifts going on here. We're just going to do a tilt. Hey, Steve, could you just point out your light sources here real quick? Because some people um, don't know exactly where they are, that your light sources are within the, sh the wide shot here, so that they can see what lights you're using. Oh, just point just out. Just point them out. <laughs> physically point? OK, yeah. OK. Um, yeah, this is, this is the key light Pico box here. And then over to the right is the Fresnel. So this is, this is just basically the, the main light source. And if you see it here, you could, it's, just a, it's basically just a, a flat metal softbox with, with amazingly even light on it. And definitely my favorite modifier by far. And then that's the Fresnel in the, in the very right. The, um, so let's try and let's see if I can get this here. This won't be exactly framed up the same way as the other shots, but it'll at least give us an idea. Um, oh, that got bright in a hurry. That's right, I had it cranked all the way to 800. Let me bring down the f-stop so that we can really see what it's doing to the shot. So yeah, so here you'll see, because it's a vertical tilt, I, I shifted the, the lens 90 degrees on the tilt shift adapter and then tilted to what's my exact I tilted downward 10 degrees so the the lens is actually going like this you'll see that the the bay leaf and the top of the figure blurry or in perfect sharpness almost immediately to the left and right it's blurry and this is a fun thing to do because it's not something that the eye normally associates with photography like you'll see an image and if you can if you can get it done in camera and have that nice natural bokeh going on it's a really fun look. I really like that complete isolation. In fact, when I do like an Instagram post, I'll, I'll use the tilt shift all the time to really isolate exactly what I want the viewer to look at. And this is kind of a way of doing that in camera and getting everything that the lens has to offer as far as uh, the depth of field look. So that's, um, that's that. Let's quickly get over to the other. This is the one I use, this light setup I use second most maybe as a starting point. Um, let's get this back to zero and then rotate it backwards and then um, get reframed here. And that's the thing with tilt shifts is you're constantly reframing anytime you do a tilt shift. Uh, landscape photographers use this all the time. This is, these tilt shifts are in incredibly useful for that style of photography. So let's get the focus back on the fig. And then so the second lighting setup I want to do involves, it's basically the reverse of this situation where I was talking about if you have meat or fish or anything that's got kind of a flat surface that would benefit from a back key light. I don't use it often, but when you need it, you need it. Because oftentimes you really are just trying to re reveal as much texture as possible. So I will have now the Fresnel acting as, and if we have time, I'll do it with the projection attachment too. In this manner, they're, they're, they're similar in the way they behave. It's just one gives different, a different type of light quality, but it's not. All right, so we've got the Fresnel attachment. You, now this is acting not as a kicker, but as a fill. So it needs to be just not as um, intense. We're only looking to get kind of a quick little splash a light in there to, to control the shadows. And then the, the Pico box, which is the key, now moves to the back. And you see with these C-stands, they're so quick to, to make lighting changes. Now with this, you're going to want to get lower. 
I, I was doing a little bit of that Rembrandt lighting with the, the key light in front where it was a little bit higher, but if you're gonna get that nice raking light look, then you can just rotate this as such, tilt it up, and with the modeling light you can see exactly, this is where the modeling light really comes in handy because then you can dial in the highlights to a T before you even take the shot. You can see from camera angle how it glistens. And anytime you're doing, this is a food styling tip, so anytime you're doing food styling you want to make sure, if you're doing it on your own, if you're just doing a still life, you want to make sure that you're always working with the camera view in mind. You decide on the camera view and then you start to bring things into frame that work around the current framing. But if, you, if you're up here like doing food styling and it looks good up there, it, it could very well look just fine. But you, every move you make on a food, from a food styling standpoint needs to be to serve the camera angle and nothing else really. I mean, you look behind some food photography sets and the amount of pins, T-pins, sponges, everything that goes into some of that, just to get a nice angle to make it look natural is pretty crazy. So you really want to, you know, all the styling you do really needs to be in service of the camera angle. That's something I um, really had to learn quick. So we've got this. Now I don't even know how this will, th this, this light is not only going to showcase, you know, th there's not as much texture on this to show off. But you'll see it in the, in the bay leaf and some of the other things. But if you have a piece of fish right here or anything that has a lot of texture or a steak, this is awesome because it really just showcases all the, it just creates this nice raking light. And then now the Fresnel is no longer the kicker. The Fresnel is actually acting as a fill card, but with more control than a fill card or a mirror. Mirrors are great and fill cards are great and they're cheap. But if you want the ultimate in control, a projection attachment or the Fresnel is actually a really nice way to get some more control. That way you could literally just have the light start here and go inward as opposed to hitting the surface of the table, which a fill car would probably naturally do. That's just, a fill is when you really just need tons of fill. In fact, I'll use these in conjunction. I'll probably just, you know, I'll get below it or above it or something just to add a little bit more fill. So they certainly have their place. This just is, it's nice to have this because you don't have to have something blocking the set so a food stylist can get in there. I could have this much further back and just have it more powerful. It just gives you more accessibility of the set, a little bit more control of the light, and you know I'll just I'll just take a shot. I don't even I just want to get something in front of me so I'm not. Um, let's see if it comes through if it's behaving with the laptop set up. And you'll notice another thing with um, medium format is the um, the frame is much different than a. Uh, DSLR. DSLRs are just a wider, um, they're a wider frame. This is a little bit more squared up, which it makes it, I think, better for a multitude of uses. You're not locked into this really wide format that DSLRs sometimes provide. All right, so what we have here is everything in the back is really getting blown, blown out, and it's just so close to the light. So we need to back up the light a little bit, not too much. What I'll often do is actually feather the light. I'll tilt it upward so that it's not hitting these white and glass background props as much. So now you're, you're going to see it's just going to be a little bit more focused on the actual subject matter. And you're getting that nice, you're still getting, you know, with these, these leaves here, you're still getting that translucency and that's coming from the actual key and no longer from the Fresnel. Now, you're going to see with a Fresnel, you're now getting these shadows on the background or, and the highlights as well that are hitting the pot. And that may be desirable, it may not be. So, but you, what you're seeing here is there's, there's a vast difference between the two lighting setups. You're getting, we went from like this. That might have been one of the earlier ones, which looks a little bit more just like natural window light. I mean, th this in a sense does too, but you're, it's the same idea, but it's reversed. So you're still getting the nice highlights on the front of the fig, a little zing there, you're getting the nice edging. So th there, it's just two different ways of looking at the same idea. This, this one, you'll know which one will work just by trying it out and getting experience in that regard, doing it over and over again. So let's get in. So in the back left, things are a little bit dark, and that's because the, 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 the light is so close it's not even hitting the key light on the left side is not even hitting the background. So I do want it to hit the background. I just want to avoid having those. And this is where if I were in studio, I'd probably use a scrim, which just is a, 
an instrument to isolate just small portions of light and bring them down tonality a little bit. But with this, I would just prefer to feather the light a little bit. Let's do that. I might just have to reboot. This happens with any capture. Let me just try a... Let me just try totally rebooting. Um, and if there's any questions regarding you know what we've done so far, I'd be happy to answer any of those while we do this. All right, turn camera off. All right. Sorry, I was running around setting up uh, the overhead power and all that. But uh, yeah, we have a few questions here. Um, well, a few comments as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so Michelle commented, I think next we need an editing Steve Hansen class. I bet that's highly trademarked, but if I'm fantasizing, <laughs> understandable. Um, we also have, uh, someone says hi from Sicily. Awesome. And a question, when I shoot flat lays with the camera from above, I get fall off on the edge items, uh, look like they're falling off the image. The only lens that I use is the 100 millimeter, probably on a full frame, uh, which is not always ideal. There's fall off. I'm wondering if it's, is it light fall? Are you talking about light fall off or warping or vignette? I believe, I want to say it's, uh, images at the edge seem to be warping, like they're falling off of the su uh, of the surface, perhaps? That would be, that, that's something you do run into with overheads, but with a 100 millimeter lens, everything should be really compressed and looking good. Figure, that, yeah. If you can get that high with 100 mil, that's, that's I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're looking good. Mm -hmm. uh, someone else asked, uh, Yash has asked, how do you manage uh, highlight midtones and shadows while shooting food? Uh, and we kind of saw that you definitely do some bounce fill and a little bit of tweaking in the, the post-processing there as you're shooting. Correct. Um, yeah, as far as highlights go, what I'll do with a key light is I'll get it, I'll get it affecting the mid-tone texture and brightness and get that perfect first. And then the first place I go is to the highlights. Now, if a highlight is going to be specular, like if it's coming off a of glass or if it's just a small pinpoint light, there's, there's, you know, in the capture software, you can drag a cursor around there and, and see where you're at, you know, between zero and 255. And some of those can be completely blown out. I mean, if you're doing a completely high key shot with the background just white, it'll just be blown out. There's nothing totally, you know, against the rules about blowing something out in camera. The nice thing about medium format is you can actually, even if you blow something out and it gets to be really close to, like, for all intents and purposes, it's pretty much washed out, you can actually bring it down with quite a bit of success and retain some of those. As far as actually getting, that'll be my second thing, and then the shadows will be third. So I'll go in and, and check the shadows and make sure that I'm not losing any information, especially, so when I go to export from Focus, I will bring up the shadows more than I normally would, like I mentioned earlier, and that really gives you a fantastic starting point. So that you just you, what you want is clean information. You don't want a perfect photo out of the can. You want stuff, if you're doing a lot of post-production work, you want stuff that will give you the flexibility and not become grainy or noisy. So obviously the first thing to do on set would be to fill it properly first. But even then, I still just, I knock up shadows, I bring down highlights before I export it, just to give me some room to work. I don't know if that totally answers your question, but so on this, uh, um, when you get a chance, if you want to switch to the overhead shot here, no rush at all though. <laughs> um, we did get a shot in. So the um, one of the things you have to watch with, so the Fresnel, that, that shot here, you know, the, the um, I can actually point it out on set here. So this, this highlight and this shadow kind of on the, the back of the pot here, it'll, it'll be hard to see, but the Fresnel is actually hitting that. Um, there's actually, there's actually a, a highlight coming right here that is undesirable. And you'll see all these random streaks of light that'll kind of get in the way. If you're looking for a nice, really cool looking caustics look where there's tons of reflections going on, this could actually be a great light for that to create. You know, if you shine this through a glass of water, 
the caustics on the, you know, the light reflections on the other side of the glass can be really beautiful. Um, in this case, I'm not wanting that. So the, a way I can get this to just affect, since we are just dealing only with fill, I can come down here, get in a little bit closer, and make sure I'm only hitting, I have to go a little bit higher. And this will affect, a, you know, the look a little bit. Everything's just really a compromise between various. So let's get this kind of up there. Maybe bring down the power a little bit because we are just looking only for fill. Let's take a shot there. Make sure we're focused. Always check focus. Early on in, a, in your food photography journey, you'll, you'll get a shot that you're like, oh my God, I love that shot so much. And you'll get in there and look at it at 100% and it won't be in focus. And you'll never do that again. So, so this, this literally couldn't be more, you know, more opposite. So in, when you gain experience, you, you'll know in your head which way to go first. Do I want this look here with a very directional front side light or do I, do I have a lot of things on the surface, which is not the case. I would choose the first lighting setup for this scene for sure. Because there just isn't enough. I mean, the fig looks a little better. Um, but the background suffers, so you'd have to do a lot more work. I would probably bring in a broader light source maybe, or put it through a, a diffuser. You can hold some diffusion material in front of this, this Pico box and get a softer light. Uh, but then you would lose some of that nice edginess. So if the, usually when I use this setup, it'll be for a, for a dark moody scene where I'm not as concerned about where the light's going to be going. Uh, for, for a nice bright scene, I'll tend to blast it really hard from the left. So, I mean, this is, this is kind of what you, you, you do get that fill, but it does look, it no longer looks like window light as much. Like, it definitely looks like window light coming from the rear, but that fill can be a little strong. Maybe we'll turn it down and see what happens. Let's turn it down all the way to, I don't know, I've never taken this down to one before, but let's try it. Maybe it just adds that nice, because my eye's definitely going off, that's, that's better. And then we can kick up the Pico box by a stop and see what that gets us. That might be a little bright. But we're getting there. You're getting more translucency. That's nice. That's not a bad look. That definitely looks like a window coming from the left. And I say windows because, I mean, food photography, especially when I first started, everything was window light. Everything was, um, I just, I didn't like the not having control over the time of day. And, you know, the highlight, the color cast on the highlights varies so much with window light. If it goes gray, blue sky, gray, blue sky, you can end up with highlights that are blue or whatever. Um, I, I still shoot natural light sometimes, but it's very rare. Um, so yeah, we're getting, you know, we're getting a highlight here. If you can switch to the software view, we're getting a highlight here that's blown out for sure. Um, and it shows on the, um, it shows on the camera but you can also see it when you click on these warning signs. See, so I'm currently, you know, on the bottom here, you can click on to get shadow warnings and then highlight warnings. Now, the ones on the jar, I'm not worried about. That's normal. That's fine. Uh, the one on the uh, plum here is a little bright. But if you, I'm, I have no shadow fill or recovery applied. If I bring in some shadow fill, you're getting, I mean, there, there's no, if you zoom into 100%, you're, you're getting very little. There's almost no artifacting going on when you go that far. But the highlight recovery is amazing. Like if you go, it's just, let, let me bring the shadow field down a little bit to get more contrast, but I mean, it's, it's pretty spectacular what you can do with the highlight recovery. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So, I mean, it affects a majority of your scene. So what I would do if I were exporting this for Photoshop, I would bring it all the way to here. I would probably bring this to here just to make sure the highlights were under control. Or if I just saw a little speck where the, where the primary specular is, and then give just enough shadow fill where I didn't feel like I was losing or getting, you know, noise tends to live in the shadows. So I would bring the shadow fill up just enough, and then that's where I would export it. Um, I've also noticed that our white balance has changed with the direction of the light, so I'll probably warm that up a bit um, just to get it back to zero here. And as you work with, you know, in photography longer, you'll get an eye for stuff like this about what... Um, natural you know it's not always about having perfect white balance some of it's creative as well especially with food where it, it can look really good really cold it can look really good really warm it, it shouldn't be about it always being neutral or perfect it, it's also about the creative aspect of it but that can also be done in post and it should be done there so here's where i kind of get it, the information i need to make a really good 
composite. So that's so these two, you know, these two final side by side. Let's we can go between the two. I'll keep it full screen so it's not too. Uh, I should have made that a select. So we got this and then this. So it's two. It's two different approaches, but it's a, it is really just a you know it's a solid starting point for. Um, uh, for food, food photography and where you want to go with it. And from there you can just take it to wherever you want to go. Let me do a quick one more, you know, a quick final thing. The flash duration on these um, strobe packs are fantastic. So you can go all the way down. We're at one seventeen hundredth of a second. And to get the right flash duration, you'll have to be around four, about half, a little bit below half power to really start to get some really um, serious it can go all the way to one ten thousandth of a second, and which is where we're at now. Um, so this will give us the ability to freeze motion, which is what I do on a regular basis. Um, I did change the intensity of the light, so we're going to have to adjust. I mean, that, that's a nice... I like that setup, actually. It's nice. Your eye really goes towards the... And this is where... So I'm going to pour some milk, and we're going to capture a quick frame... Um, We'll get this reconnected. I'm going to capture a quick frame of milk hitting the um, hitting the bowl. I mean, this isn't like a cereal shot, but it could might as well, you know it could very well just be that. So what I've done is I've gone into focus and raised the shutter on the camera. For some reason, I think it's just a power drain on my laptop that's just causing between the HDMI and the actual. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it's rare to have any dropouts really for me on studio, uh, on set. So let's take this shot real quick. So you'll notice the, 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 the shot happened a lot faster. So we pour. Oh wow, look at that neon Pepto-Bismol we have going on there. There we go. So you'll see these shots are going to be coming in over and over again. We'll see if we can get one that had a nice splash on it. But this will freeze, this pack can freeze. It, even if you throw something as hard as you can and take a shot, you'll still get a really nice, sharp, clean image. You know, it'll freeze motion so well and so reliably. And another thing is that the recycle time is really nice and low, so you're not constantly worried about, you know, exposures being slightly different because it didn't have time to recharge. But I think we got one here. I guess I just didn't throw it hard enough. Let's go back to one of these first shots. I mean, we get a li at least a little bit. I just don't want to mess up the uh, the studio here. I have to clean up everything. All right, so you'll see you get that edge that's just absolutely stunning. Like there's no, there's almost no, fr really no fringing on it. It's just perfectly, perfectly still. And that'll even happen if you have something really, even if you fling a bucket of something through the air as fast as you can, you're still going to get that really nice sharp look. So for liquids and for anything that requires splashes, um, I really like the consistency of these, these packs. But yeah, I'll take any questions. It was, really, it was really wonderful to kind of show you just a couple of quick setups to get started. And it's kind of up to you to take this and run with it and see what you can do. And feel free to tag me any shots you do with it. And I'd love to take a look. Awesome. Well, we do have some, of course, comments saying that uh, love what you're doing, but let's see. Somebody was wondering what would be an entry level tilt shift that you could suggest. I know that there's like a lot of options, but among all camera yeah. uh, brands. But uh, any suggestions or like focal lengths or what have you? The um, the tilt shift for I used. Early, I still use for certain applications the Nikon and the Nikon tilt shifts, and those were where I got started. Um, and they've the, the ones that they're currently like the 19 millimeter is apparently built like a tank. It's really good. Um, if you want to do tilt shift effects on a budget, it's actually really good. It's good to do in Photoshop. I mean, in commercial work, that's where they're doing it anyways. I've almost never been asked to provide a shot where the focal tilts were built into the shot. That's more for my personal work and for, you know, if I, if I just want to kind of mess around with the tilts. And I, it's more if I want to get everything front to back sharp. But if you, if you, you can achieve the front to back sharpness by doing focus stacking where you don't need a tilt shift. 
Um, so that, that's really a, but if you want the creative tilt shifts, the ones, the filters in Photoshop are really good for that regard. I'd, I've never done it, but I think you can do something called, I, I'm going to get my 3D and photography terminology mixed up, but a depth map in 3D is where you can have, it's kind of a, uh, they call it a Z plane, where you have, it's black to white, but it's a mask based on the depth of your camera. I think it'd be great for camera manufacturers to actually create some sort of sensor that would give you a Z depth map which would allow you, it's just basically a black and white map of how far away something is from the lens. Um, and then you can actually create genuine front to back focal effects legitimately in a really nice way. But if you just want to get a nice tilt shift effect, you can do it in Photoshop. And you just won't have the, what the lens brings to the table, which is like that, that, bokeh, you know, that bokeh personality that each lens kind of has a, it has a slightly different signature. So if you really want to get artsy with that stuff, uh, I do, I've heard the Canon tilt shifts are really fantastic for entry level. Um, they're really known for their good tilt shifts. Uh, I just, I used Nikon early on and then when I got a hold of this, I was just, I think I actually got that piece used for a really reasonable price. Um, I just happened to see it on eBay or something like that, but uh, the, the tilt shifts, the, the tilt shifts that are on the camera, it, it's just pretty specific. If you're doing landscape photography, then you need a tilt shift for sure. Um, if you're doing food, I don't need it. But when it's there, when it's not there, you know, if I, if I don't have the ability to, to kind of like get that focal plane at an angle to get everything focused, that's when I started to realize I didn't need that. But that's, it's a limited use. Because you can also focus stack with, with things that don't move, you're fine. So. Speaking of focus stacking, uh, someone did ask what software or program do you use to merge the images together? Oh my goodness. Um, I don't even remember. Oh my goodness. That's the thing is I, I've gotten into 3D so heavily over the last three years that I've forgotten all software shortcuts for the most part because I've had to remember so much. And I do, I do focus stacking so little, it's almost done after the fact. Uh, what's the main one? Uh, there's one that everybody uses and I've totally forgotten what it is. I haven't used it in like a year. Um, if you Google it, if you Google focus stacking software, it'll it'll be the first thing to come up. There's 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 one that just does it perfectly, and there's like an A, B, and C filter. I, I'm getting killed on this, I'm sure, online because everybody. Helicon focus. Yeah, helicon focus. Helicon focus. It's it's the one that I use for all. It, it's so straightforward to use because you'll drop your images into the software. You'll tell it which algorithm to use, and I think C is usually the best. I'm not sure. You just have to try out and see which works best, but. If you take a shot, like in here, if I took a focal, sh if I took a shot, and then every like centimeter, I took another shot, zoomed in a little more, a little more, front to back, until everything was at some point in focus. You drag those, you export those, and drag them into um, as TIFFs, I think, and drag them into Helicon, and then run the algorithm. It almost always works if nothing moves. It, it's just, it's really nice. But sometimes it's just weird sharp. Like you're looking at it going, <laughs> it's just. Like you can zoom in and, and the very back is just as front. It, it, like in 3D, a lot of the stuff that we do to make it more photographic is actually the opposite of what photographers do to make it more um, perfect. Like we'll, we'll actually add noise to stuff. We'll, you know, 3D artists will add noise. They'll add um, bokeh. Every, every, anything they can do to not make it look like it was a focus stack. Because that's what a render is essentially is a, a complete front to back sharp image. So um, it's kind of funny how those two worlds interact. But yeah, that's a great software, long story short. Helicon. Helicon. Helicon Focus. Uh, so another question, uh, is it worth the medium format 50 megapixels over a 50 megapixel DSLR? And I have my feelings about that, and, <laughs> but uh, that there's a reason for the price jump and what you're getting with those megapixels. Um, yeah, it's not just, like I, I don't care, I really don't care about gear at all. Like I want it to work well, and I want it to give me stuff that I can use. Um, and, it's, and you know, especially in 3D, there is no there is no camera brand. There's just a camera that you throw into the scene to render something. But in photography, there's like hundreds of like there's so much to there's different kinds of lights. In 3D, there's only the light. It's kind of funny. Like there's no and you don't pay for it. It's free. Like <laughs> um, the um, and oftentimes what I'll do in photography is I'll actually have a set that has this lighting set up. And I'll match it in 3D, and I have a server full of you know scanned food items that might be out of season, and I can actually drop it into the Photoshop file, and it'll look like it was 
photograph. But um, to answer your question, the, the reason I chose medium format, and I go between the two, I'll use DSLRs for certain things, especially if I know that we're gonna be throwing liquids just all over, it's just gonna be an absolute, especially powder. If I shoot powder, I'll probably use the DSLR and tie it off. Um, there's not a massive difference strictly from a pixel to pixel standpoint. It's also the usable pixels in the frame. If I know that I'm gonna need to get something sort of in one shot, and it's gonna be a wider final format, and the DSLR format works better for that format, I might use it. But for a majority of my work, you're actually getting more usable pixels in the, you know, the, the, I don't know what the exact dimensions are of this particular sensor, but it's much more squared off. So you're getting more, more use out of those 50 pixels than you would for a 45 megapixel. Um, and if you include the fact that the bit depth is a little deeper and you can do a lot more manipulation in post, and you know the fact that if you want to get the quality of a medium format, I mean, on my DSLR, I've got a lot of the Zeiss Otis lenses, which are amazing. And they, they, it was basically like taking a blindfold off of my DSLR. But you're still paying, like, those lenses are five grand or something like that. So you're still, if you really want to get the highest quality you can, you're still almost spending, I, I kind of got tired, like I had so many lenses and so many different, I wanted a system that really, especially with the flashes, I wanted everything to kind of work together as one piece. And um, so that, and I, I started off with Broncolor early in my career with, with commercial shoots, and they were just rented, but I got used to them and I loved them. So, and the system just works so well together. But there's so many things between the tilt shift, the quality of the lenses, the, um, you know, I bought the camera new, but some of my lenses are used. You can get them, you can rent them if you, if you want, you know, over a weekend, if you know your shots and you want to get like 10 awesome shots, then maybe rent the pack for, you know, it's not crazy expensive compared to buying it. And so you can get used to using it so that as you progress through your career, if that's what you want to do, um, these professional tools become much more affordable in a hurry. It's not, it's not the overall investment. When I was younger, I was like, there's no way I'd ever, like, why would I even, I'll never be able to get a media formatter. It's it just, it just, you progress and your needs will determine what you get, and if your needs determine, you'll just know. You should never buy anything just for the heck of it, just so you have it. But medium format is like, there's there's some diminishing returns, but they those small improvements incrementally, whether it's the tilt shift quality or or the dependability or the light quality, or it all starts to add up over and over again. It's like it's like tracks on an audio mix. Like if there's if you have a really nice compressor that costs you thousands of dollars but you use it just on one track, you're gonna be like, eh, why do you? but if you use it on track after track after track, and the, the quality of that starts to compound on itself, you start to notice what you paid for, it's kind of that similar idea. So I, yeah, I really, I really like the, uh, um, and on set, I've never had, it's never dropped out of me, and it's really just a beautiful um, piece, of, uh, piece of machinery to have on set, for sure. Excellent, uh, we have one comment and one last question. Uh -huh. Uh, we'd have a comment, wow, sign us up for an entire flash duration class with Steve and Glazers. Uh, <laughs> so we can get that on the books. I'm sure Kate uh, can make that happen. And a question, are there any good resources that you would recommend on lighting setups and what entry level lights would you recommend? And that has been seconded by another commenter. So people are very interested in that. Oh yeah, as far as, as, far as entry level lighting setups? Yeah, entry level lighting I mean, setups and probably more resources on to learn lighting, I suppose. I actually learned, so this, this is something I've taught in some of my other classes, you should learn, what we're doing here is creating art. We're not, manip we're not you know, I have digital text on set, I have people who help me. Um, when I do motion, I've got a, a, a DP, and they take the, the workload off of my head as far as the technical. And I've forgotten some of the, like the technical, it, it's, I'm creating art in my vision and I need the technical to take care of itself. And the, um, I learned from, I think Joe McNally had some really good classes on Creative Live. Yeah. I learned everything about lighting early on from him, like, and, and maybe a few others. And I didn't follow food photographers because the second you start following, like it, it, just food photographers, you start to shoot just like, they do, and you start to like subconsciously start to like absorb their style, which is the opposite of what you want to do. So I'll, I'll follow landscape photographers. I'll follow especially sports photographers because they have this really cool approach to lighting. Because 
you know, a lot of people have seen, you know, food can be so all over the map. Like the subject matter that can be put in front of your camera for food is every, every day is completely new. But if you're shooting, you know, if you're shooting product or athlete, like the lighting really starts to come into play. And I think Joe and, and uh, Tim Tatters and other guys is just fantastic with that. They're so creative in the way that they, um, they, they have to light something to really tell a story. And food photography can sometimes, a lot of the times, just literally be a window and beautiful food, and it looks great. So, the, I mean, the, the, the first lighting I would invest in is, is diffusion for your window. Like, if you get a really light diffusion paper and then tape it to your window, you've got amazing light right there and a fill card, and you're done. And you can do, entire careers have been made on that lighting alone. Uh, there's a lot of natural light photographers who have major studios, but all they do is shoot natural light because yeah. it looks really good. Um, but it depends where you want to go with it. If you find your, art, you know, your artistic sensibilities taking you elsewhere, which for me it was, is really edgy and really, you know, um, very deliberate, I guess. Mm. Um, then I had to go with much more small, smaller controlled pieces of equipment. It just, and I, window light's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. And, but, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, we at Glazer's Camera, like when people ask and I'm working in lighting, uh, how should I get started? And it's like, well, we sell diffusion, various types of diffusion, and uh, by the foot, it's like seven dollars a foot. Mm -hmm. That's a really inexpensive way to get started. Just learning how to shape light um, that's naturally occurring, so you can make hard light soft. It's not as easy to make soft light hard, but it is possible um, using it's like mirrors or uh, something like. Uh, any sort of like focusing optic or what have you. But uh, yeah, foam core, you can get like four foot by eight foot here, and that you can learn about bouncing light with a white side or subtracting light with the black side. Uh, but there's also a lot of different lighting kits that we offer here at Glazers to get you started and maybe graduate you to the broad color options uh, that we also. Yeah, and if I can interject really quick, yeah. um, a big thing is how, a good way to learn lighting too is, I mean, I use the modeling lights here, but also just get a really cheap pair of LED lights um, that are continuous. So you can see what's happening sure. on set for sure. And also another thing to do is to, to maybe invest in a black card or a card covered in black foam or a black felt and use that. So if you have window light that's just going everywhere, you can put that on the top of your set if you're shooting you know, at three quarter and it'll actually make the light a lot more dramatic because it, it forces the light downward at an angle and cuts off a lot of the, the fill. When you're doing natural light, it's always about reducing and cutting light, and when you're doing strobes, it's about bringing in light. So it's almost the opposite approach, but LED lights are a good way to, to at least start so that when you're yeah. doing strobe stuff, which is a little bit more consistent, I think, and um, it just has a different workflow, but it's, it's just a really good way. I already know what something's gonna kind of look like when I take the shot, and that took a while, and it was a lot of it was just messing around with continuous lighting. Excellent. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up. We're running only 20 minutes over. It's no big deal. Uh, we're happy to have all of you here joining us, watching us live. Uh, Glazers is still operational to the best of our ability with uh, guidelines and being able to sanitize and keep everyone safe here. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday, uh, Monday through Friday, nine to six, and we're open Saturday, nine to five. If you do need to come down, uh, we are open to a limited capacity, so we try to be as one-on-one -on -one as we can. But you're also welcome to uh, browse the store at your leisure. But uh, thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. And uh, if you need to give us a call here at Glazers, our number is two zero six six two four one one zero zero. And we do also have a survey that you could take. Uh, let me get that still up here. So if you go to this URL, uh, you have a chance of winning a prize uh, pack raffle. So if you go to the URL, fill out the survey, enter for your chance to win. And this is another great image by Steve. Uh, I was a little afraid initially that um, it was going to get a lot messier in here since I see a lot of his photography features flying foods. But um, I, was, I was prepared. We, we were going to be, I was willing to clean up, but thankfully we just had the, <laughs> the overhead, the, the milk pouring, so it didn't get too, too messy here. Thankfully. Well, thank you, Steve, for being here. 
Uh, we'll Thanks we'll make that me. that flash duration class sometime. We'll make that happen. It's a complex subject, but it's important. Yeah, it's yeah. important. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to get this still back up, and I hope you have an excellent day.